morning, everybody. Welcome. Welcome. And welcome to those of you watching on the video. Um, today, we are going to be continuing our sermon series, um, which is looking at women in the Bible. And today, we are going to be looking at a woman called Lydia. And you'll find her story in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 16, verses 11 to 15. <coughs> 16 verses 11 to 15. So I'll start reading that bit of the text. So, from Troas we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace. I don't know if that's the correct spelling, but I've given it a go. I mean, not spelling, what am I saying? Pronunciation, that's the one. And the next day we went on to Neapolis. From there, we travelled to Philippi, a Roman colony, and the leading city of that district of Macedonia. And we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river, where we expected to find a place for prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira, named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshipper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. That's it. That's the story of Lydia. And yes, I'm going to speak for about 30 minutes about it. Okay, five verses. But it's good, there's a lot in there. Okay, let's just set this in context for a bit. All right? So, the book of Acts, right? It follows on from the Gospel of Luke. Um, it's widely accepted that the author of Luke and Acts is the same. They kind of fit together and follow on from each other. Okay, Luke was a physician and a part-time missionary um, who helped Paul out on his mission, some of his missionary trips. Luke was most likely to be a Gentile believer, and by that we mean he wasn't Jewish. He was, he was outside of the Jewish um, religion and tradition and, 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 and people, but he was still a believer. And we can kind of pick this up because Paul names him separately. Um, in the list from his Jewish associates in Colossians 4. This kind of explains Luke's interest in the gospel moving out from its Jewish roots out into the rest of the world. See, in the Jewish mindset, you had Jews and everybody else. And the name they gave to everybody else was the Gentiles. Okay, so being a Gentile believer, Luke is quite passionate, as you would understand, about the gospel moving out from Jerusalem, from the Jewish people, out into the Gentile world, out into the rest of the world. And if we look at the book of Acts as a whole, and we can see that it's telling us the story of the birth of the Christian church, because Christianity didn't start until Jesus came along. And did you know that Jesus was a Jew? Jesus wasn't a Christian, okay? Christianity started after Jesus had died and rose again, and the people who followed him and his teachings then believed in Jesus and tried to follow his teachings. Then Christianity started, okay? The book of Acts tells of this early beginning of the Christian church, and it's split into four main sections. First of all, we have the Spirit, the Holy Spirit that empowers the church to be able to tell others about Jesus, to go and witness about him. Then we see some stories about the, the apostles, the disciples at the time, um, witnessing in Jerusalem, okay, starting with their most nearby um, people where they were. Then we see them going beyond Jerusalem, taking the message out beyond the city into the surrounding area. 
And from there, the book of Acts then shows us the gospel moving even further than that, going out into the rest of the world. So it's like concentric circles. We can see the gospel starting and moving, and Christianity and the church starting and moving out as more and more people know and hear about Jesus and accept him. And we find our story of Lydia in this fourth section where we're being told about the gospel going out to the ends of the earth, okay, out to the Gentiles. And I'm not a Jew, so I'm a Gentile, okay, and I think everyone else in the room is as well, okay. We also find this story um, tying in with Paul, okay, because Paul has started off on his second missionary journey. He was traveling around, telling people about Jesus and starting churches as he went. And on this journey, he arrives, in our story, in the town of Philippi. Okay? In modern day settings, I, when I was preparing this sermon, I thought, okay, right, where's Philippi? I haven't really heard of it. So I looked it up on a map, and this is where you can find it. Okay? I don't think it's called Philippi anymore, but the place that was called Philippi, this is where it is. So it's in modern day Greece. Okay? On the Aegean Sea, fairly close to the Bulgarian border, okay? So that's where Philippi was, and that's where this story happened. And this is where Paul and his company of missionaries were at this point. So we see the gospel spreading out into the earth as a whole. And we told in our story that they stayed several days, okay? And believe it or not, that was enough time to start a church, Okay? The same church that he writes the letter of Philippians to. And we have Philippians in the Bible. And that's a letter he wrote to the Philippian church, which actually we're seeing the birth of here in the story of Lydia. So, in the notes I've read of other translations, here you see Lydia is described as a worshipper of God at the very beginning, okay? And I thought to myself, oh great, so that means she's a Christian, right? But no, it suggests that Lydia was either a Gentile God-fearer or more likely a Jewish convert, okay? So someone who might have converted to Jew Judaism somewhere along the route, okay? But notice, even though she is described as a worshipper of God, She's still not yet a Christian. Okay. Now, she still needed to be saved. How many of us here fear God? How many of us worship God? But if you haven't given your life to Jesus... You still need to do that, just like Lydia, okay? Being a Christian is a lifelong decision to believe and follow Jesus, to allow him to be Lord, to be in charge of your life, to be the boss. It is so much more than attending a church service or singing a song that mentions God. It's about entering into a relationship with Jesus, and that is the key, okay? So without that, that needs to be done. And we see in the story that Lydia, even though she was a worshiper and someone who feared God, still needed to ask Jesus into her life. She still needed to be saved. In other words, she still needed to repent, believe, and, we see later in the story, be baptized. Okay? And we can see Lydia going through this process. In Philippi, the missionaries arrived. What was usually their kind of format, as it were, they would go to a Jewish temple and start teaching the people about Jesus. Okay? But because they're outside of mostly Jewish sort of areas, they're out in the rest of the world, 
Um, there weren't really that many Jewish people about. Not enough to warrant a temple. So they didn't have a temple to go and base operations at, as it were. Um, so instead, they've obviously done a bit of chatting and found out, oh, it, the, Jew, the Jewish people, they go and pray down by the river. Okay, well, that's where we'll go. So they went down to the river. Notice how a lack of building doesn't stop them or doesn't stop the gospel from advancing. Just because you don't have a church building doesn't mean you can't have church. Okay? Church is the group of people, not a building. All right? So, they didn't let the lack of a building or a facility stop them. Okay? You see, the gospel of Jesus cannot be contained. It is unstoppable. And I will say that in some church circles where people are not coming to the church building, people start saying, oh, the church is dead, the church is dying. That will never happen. The church may not meet in that building. It might meet somewhere else. But the church and the people of God will continue. Notice how they did evangelism. And I do that because it's a term that we use in church. What does evangelism mean? When you hear the word evangelism, it's like a big complicated word. What is it? Going and bearing witness about Jesus Christ. Telling people about Jesus, yeah. basically. Telling people about Jesus. That's it. That's what it means. Okay? Now, sometimes, I know when I hear the word, I sometimes picture... You get out a loudspeaker and stand on a street corner, right? And you start telling everyone who walks past, Oh, you're going to go to hell if you don't come to Jesus! <laughs> and you go on and on, standing on the street corner with your loudspeaker. That's one of the things that comes to mind, okay? Did they hit the streets with a five-step method of getting someone saved? Did they host a big event to attract the masses? No. Did they go around the houses knocking on the doors? Yeah. No. What they did is they simply had a conversation. And these days, we might like to have our conversation with a cup of tea. Okay? I don't know if they had tea in Bible times, all right? But I'm pretty sure there was some food and drink involved in their chat and conversation that they had. Okay? Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that the other forms of evangelism I've mentioned are wrong, okay? I'm not saying that they're not valid or that they're ineffective. What I am saying is that they are not the only ways to do it, okay? Everybody can evangelize, okay? It can be as simple as having a conversation. In fact, I'm going to be running a course starting in January called Talking Jesus. And the whole point of this course is that it will empower and equip us to simply have conversations with people we know about Jesus. So keep out, look out for information about that that will be coming out in the next few weeks, okay? Right. And while they were having their conversation, Lydia was among the women they were chatting with about Jesus sitting by the river, having a chat, saying a few prayers. Lydia came from a nearby town called Thyatira, which was famous for its purple goods. Now, it's, it's strange. Why mention the color? How, how strange. Okay? Because in those days, the color purple was quite a difficult job to get. 
and to put into cloth, all right? That's how come we see lots of royalty and things have purple, because it shows wealth. Because buying purple cloth in those days, okay, hey, look at that purple. <laughs> It's a lot cheaper these days. Yeah, well, <laughs> I won't go into my family history, but it could, it could have been, it could have been. But anyway, okay, so yes, very expensive purple cloth, okay? So that's why purple is mentioned, because she sells expensive stuff, okay? She sells expensive materials, expensive clothing. Lydia is a merchant. She is a businesswoman, okay? She buys, she sells, she does deals, okay? She worked, and she was successful. How do we know she was successful? Well, later in the story, we're told she's got a fairly big house, okay? Enough to have a household, which are people who work for her, okay? Doing the cooking, doing the cleaning, that kind of thing, right? And she's also got space in the house, for the missionaries to come and stay, because she says, oh, come to my house, come stay with me. So we can kind of work out from that, that oh, she's got a fairly large house with a household, so her expensive clothing business must actually be going pretty well. Okay? Lydia is this businesswoman. When she becomes a Christian, no one tells her that being a businesswoman is wrong. Or that the only way she can really serve Jesus is to become a priest or a pastor. Or, no, the only way you can really worship Jesus is to play a guitar and be a worship leader. Yeah? Or, or be a preacher. You can't really worship Jesus unless you're preaching at the front. You're not really worshipping Jesus unless you go to China and be a missionary. Okay? Lots of people do those things, but that's what God has called them to do. The question we should be asking ourselves is, what has God called us to do? Okay? She carries on being a businesswoman. In fact, it was important that she continued to work. Why? Because she would encounter different people day by day as she went about her business. More people who could see how perhaps she did business a bit differently to others. Honestly, with integrity. Perhaps they would wonder what made Lydia different within the marketplace. But equally as important, there would be more people she could have conversations with. About how knowing Jesus has impacted her life. And we know that the ministry needs funds, okay? If, if you want to produce a leaflet or, I don't know, have a website or whatever these days, you need some money. And even in, the, in those days as well, you know, they might, when the church started, they might have wanted to find somewhere to actually meet. They might have had to hire a, a house or a venue or something or feeding people, whatever. You need some money. So Lydia's there earning money. And that will help finance the, the mission and the, the birth of the church as well as having these extra conversations. Sowing more seeds of faith out into the world around her. Now. I want you to know that it is a good thing. Okay. Being a builder is a good thing. Being a homemaker is a good thing. Being a businesswoman or a businessman is a good thing. Being a teacher is a good thing. Working in the post office is a good thing. Being a lawyer is a good thing. Being a support worker is a good thing. Being retired, hey, it's a great thing. Yeah? Okay? Even if we don't have a job, we still have people who we encounter every day 
who we can have a conversation with. Being a friend is a good thing. We can all do that. We can all have conversations. And within those conversations, we can sow seeds. We can mention how blessed we are. We can say how prayer has worked for us. How Jesus has stepped into our situation and changed circumstances. How faith in Jesus makes us better and stronger people. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay? Now, I've heard a story about a church. I'm not sure where it is. But I like it, so I'm going to tell it to you. At the back of the church, by the big doors that you go out of, right, at the end, above the doors, on the inside of the building, they've got a big sign that says, Welcome to the worship service. When's the time that you're going to see that sign? On the inside. When you're going out. When you're leaving the church. Yes, it's great for the church to gather, to encourage each other, to learn, to build each other up, to strengthen each other. But it's so much more important for the church to go out and take that love, take that news, that message about Jesus out into the world, out into the post office, out into the building yard out into the, the school rooms, out into the sports fields, out into the squash courts, out into the supermarkets, out into the swimming pools. Yeah. <laughs> that's where, that's where people need to hear. The church these days, we really need to change our minds about putting on events and trying to get people in. Trying to get people in, get people in, get people in. No, we should be getting people out. Getting out, getting out. That's what we should be doing. That's what we should be focusing on. And who goes out? It's you, it's you, it's you, it's me. Yes, gather, but also scatter. Now, as we sow our seeds of faith, and as we throw them out into the lives of all those around us, notice what happens in the passage. The missionaries sat down and began to speak to a whole group of women. A whole group. But we are told that Lydia responded. Only one person from the whole group. So had the missionaries failed, only one person came to faith in Jesus out of a whole group. Maybe they should give up, go home. Maybe they should just stop having conversations with people. No. Notice how it's their job to sow the seeds, to talk about Jesus, to tell people that Jesus had saved them from their sin and that he can do the same for them. But that's it. They sow, and then they sow some more, and that's all. If we look at the parable of the sower that Jesus told, and one of the places you can find that is in Matthew 13. In that parable, notice how not all of the seeds fall on good ground. Some fall on hard ground, others fall on rocky ground, others grow up with weeds, and the weeds eventually choke and kill them. But the thing is, some do fall on good ground. Not all of them, but some of them do. Okay. Notice, when we have conversations with people, just like the missionaries did when they were talking to that group of women with Lydia, your conversation may not lead to someone accepting Jesus as their Lord and Saviour on the spot. But you have started to break up the hard ground. They may not be ready for the seed to take root yet. God might still have a lot of earthworks to do in their lives. Yeah, he might have to get his hard hat out still and do some stuff. It is our job 
to sow. It's not our job to save. We don't do the saving. Only Jesus can do that. We are not Jesus. So we need to stop trying to do his job. In our passage, we are told in verse 14 that the Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. Okay? Paul didn't. Paul's message didn't. The Lord opened her heart. Paul sowed lots of seeds, but only reaped one person on this occasion. But that's okay, because there's nothing Paul can do. There's nothing you or I can do to make someone respond to Jesus. That's not our part to play. So what do we do? We are to sow, and also we are to prepare to gather the harvest in. The Holy Spirit does the harvesting, not us, but we gather it. We collect what's already been harvested. Okay? We provide community. We provide support, the church, into which the new believer can come and grow into maturity in Christ. We sow the seeds of faith. The Holy Spirit gives them life. Together we partner with him to grow. And spiritual growth, let me just say, is a personal thing. The church can only come alongside somebody. All right? Ultimately, we each have to take our own responsibility for our own spiritual growth. Now, I can stand in a pot of manure for as long as you like, but it won't help you to grow. Okay? It might do me some good. Maybe not. Okay? But it's not going to help your relationship with Jesus. You see, I can't have a relationship with Jesus for you. You can't have a relationship with Jesus for somebody else. You have a relationship with Jesus for yourself. You can come alongside others and say, oh, this is what God showed me, or this is what's happened with me, or can I pray for you? Or, that's, that's great. That, that's needed and important. But if you come to a church and you think, well, go on then, make me grow. Yeah? It's not going to work. Alright? You have got to take responsibility for your own personal growth. I have to take responsibility for my own personal growth because nobody else can do it for me. I can get help along the way, but ultimately it's down to me. It's down to you. <coughs> okay? And we do see in our story Lydia taking responsibility. She takes responsibility. She responds to the message of Paul. She chooses to believe. I think she must have also repented because this is an important part of the salvation process. Even though it's not explicitly written down in the text, I'm pretty sure that happened as well. And we see... that Lydia was also baptized, all right? I've got this just in case someone wants to have a go today. <laughs> right, Lydia was also baptized. She takes responsibility for her personal growth and development by responding and obeying Jesus' command for every believer to be baptized. Baptism is a public declaration of her inward reality. Inwardly, she has chosen to repent and believe in Jesus. She has been born again. Her old life has passed and her new life has begun. So in baptism, Lydia identifies with the death of Jesus as she is submerged into a watery grave. Her old life is gone. 
And she raises up out of the water, identifying with the resurrection of Jesus as she starts a new life. Cleaned up and forgiven. A new life, living with Jesus as her Lord and Master. Here are a few questions I'm going to put to you today. Have you repented? Have you asked Jesus to forgive you of your sin? Do you believe? Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died and that he rose again? Do you? Have you been baptized? Have you been submerged in water, publicly declaring your faith and your decision to follow Jesus? Dying to your old self and raising to new life in him? If your answer is no, or I'm not sure to any of these questions, please do speak to me or one of the overseers at the end of the sermon. We'd love to chat to you about it. And if you're watching the video online and you also are unsure or your answer is no, please do email us at hello at kingswisbeach.org.uk and we would love to have a conversation with you as well. So in conclusion then, going to church or being a good person is not going to save you. Only a personal relationship with Jesus can do that. Our job is sowing. So go and sow seeds of the kingdom through your relationships and conversations. Wherever God has placed you at work and at play, that is your mission field. And it is good. We are each responsible for our own personal spiritual growth and development. And as Lydia did, if we haven't done it ourselves, we should do it. But let's take the message of Jesus' love and hope out into the world so that people can choose for themselves whether to repent, believe, and be baptized. <laughs>